Hi, welcome to Your Great Journey. Each week, we offer you brief tips, techniques, and insights to help you master big change. For more information, please visit yourgreatjourney.com. Your Great Journey is brought to you by audiobook publisher Wetware Media. Wetware Media publishes a wide variety of personal transformation audiobooks available from any major online audiobook retailer. For more information, please visit wetwaremedia.com. That's W E T W A R E M E D I A.com. Have you noticed that the excitement you feel after hearing good news or achieving a goal tends to be fleeting? Have you ever wondered what your life would be like if you could put aside your anxieties about the future, regrets about the past, and constant longing to change your life for the better, and awaken to the joy of living? Today we're addressing these questions with an excerpt from The Buddha's Way of Happiness, Healing Sorrow, Transforming Negative Emotion, and Finding Well-Being in the Present Moment, by psychologist Thomas Bien. This audiobook is a guide to identifying the barriers to happiness you create in your own life. You'll learn how to use the Eightfold Path of Buddhist Psychology to improve your ability to appreciate the small, joyful moments that happen every day. In this excerpt, Dr. Bien shares that happiness doesn't exist in a hypothetical future, but is always available to you right now, in the present moment. If we can't learn how to be happy in this moment, Can we really expect to be happy in the future? Long ago and far away. Some 2,500 years ago, a young man sat at the base of a tree in northern India. His skin was deep brown from exposure to the hot sun, his beard and hair matted and unkempt. The rags he wore barely concealed his skeletal frame. The young man's name was Siratta Gautama. Only a few years before, abrupt encounters with the harsh reality of human life had struck this sensitive and intelligent young man with savage force, leaving a profound existential wound. Afterward, he set out from his home of wealth and privilege, vowing not to rest until he found the answer to the predicament of human suffering, until he found the way to end it. That was now his single-pointed intention. To this end, he studied with some of the greatest spiritual teachers of his day, mastering their teachings with relative ease. And while these teachings were helpful, he remained unsatisfied. He still didn't know the answer. For the sake of other beings and himself, he was determined to find the way, and his determination was strong. He had lived the life of an extreme ascetic, barely attending to basic bodily needs of food, water, and shelter holding on to life by the thinnest of threads. But on this particular day, he accepted a cup of milk and a handful of rice. It amazed him how much better he felt. His mind was so much clearer. It was so much easier to meditate with a bit of nourishment. He vowed never to treat his body so harshly in the future. And with greater determination than ever, he vowed not to move from his spot beneath the tree until he found the answer. That night, he received the breakthrough he had longed for. It changed him. From then on, when people met him, they knew they were in the presence of a remarkable person. They asked him, Are you a divine being? Are you a saint or an angel? But he denied being anything of the kind. When they asked what he was, he merely responded, I am awake, Bud. And forever after, people called him Buddha the Awakened One. It said that when he got his breakthrough that night, the earth shook to its foundations. What was it that Siddhartha had come to understand? His happiness was so striking that, in addition to being known as Buddha, he was also known as Sagatta, the Happy One. What can he tell us about how to end our suffering and find well-being? What can he tell us about being happy? In essence, he shows us that, When we remove certain erroneous views we have of the nature of reality, happiness shines forth. Here, and in the chapters that follow, we will look together at the Buddha's insights and how they can help us transform our suffering and find happiness. Here and Now 
Driving on the interstate recently, I spotted a billboard that revealed a lot about our idea of happiness. The billboard featured someone resting in a hammock with two bottles of Coke. The text read, simply, Open Happiness. This advertisement shows that our idea of happiness has something to do with relaxing, and that's not a bad place to start. But it's also an ironic place to start, since most of us do so little of it. Most of us are better at doing and accomplishing than at taking it easy. This is so much the case that even when we finally have time to relax, we find it difficult to actually do so. After so much doing, we find it hard to have any sort of calmness or peace. Our bodies remain on alert, full of tension, our minds worried and restless. We simply cannot run around frantically all day and then suddenly relax, unless it's just to crash from exhaustion. Sometimes we try to relax by watching movies or television or reading novels or magazines. This at least lifts us out of our usual preoccupations. But generally, we expose ourselves to these media indiscriminately, and our bodies and minds become stressed by the very experience we use to try to relax. To truly relax involves just being, and we're not very good at that. If the billboard captures an element of truth in the idea that happiness is related to relaxing, it's obvious nonsense that happiness will come to us in a bottle of anything. Commercialism and consumerism leave us empty. We would scarcely be taken in at all by this notion if we stopped and thought about it for a moment. Subtle advertising messages can only affect us if they slip in sideways while we're not really paying close attention. The idea that some product will make us happy doesn't survive even cursory examination. Happiness is available. The billboard implies another message. Happiness is found outside ourselves. If we can only acquire the right things and use or consume them, find the right people and be with them, get the right job, find the right psychotherapy, have enough money, and many other such schemes, we will be happy. Some of these things may be pleasant and even helpful, but the underlying implication that happiness is found outside ourselves, is destructive. How then do you find happiness? First, by realizing that happiness is always available. The moment you see the truth of this, you can be happy right away. You don't need to do anything else. You don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to reform yourself or become a different person. Happiness is very simple. It's only our tendency to complicate things that makes it difficult. Happiness is simple because ultimate truth is simple. When Christ says, the kingdom of heaven is within, when the prophet hears God tell him to be still and know, we can't believe that's all there is to it. All religions have come into existence because people want something elaborate and attractive and puzzling, comments the Hindu sage Ramana Maharshi. We have to add all manner of complications. We must have the correct belief. We have to follow certain rules. And all of this only obscures the fundamental truth, sometimes to such a degree that religion often insulates us from the lightning inside of awakening instead of facilitating it. And it isn't just religion that makes happiness complicated. We manage to do this in many other ways as well. Many of the ways we go about seeking happiness only make it more difficult to find and even prevent us from finding it. Happiness is always available. This means, first of all, that you can be happy right now just as you are in whatever circumstances you find yourself. There's nothing that needs to happen first for you to be happy. There's nothing that has to be added, subtracted, or changed. You don't have to be someone else you can be happy right now. Since happiness is always available, the real question is whether you are available to happiness. As the Upanishads tell us, joy is the underlying nature of things. You don't have to manufacture it. You need only remove the obstacles, including your unexamined concepts about happiness. When you learn to be available to happiness, these obstacles vanish you immediately see that there's already enough, right here and right now, for you to be happy. There's already enough happiness at hand. 
Consider our everyday human senses and capacities. You already have eyes that open you to the realm of wonderful forms and colors, ears that open you to the realm of beautiful sounds. You have two good hands, capable of doing many helpful and wonderful things. You have legs and feet that afford you the pleasure of walking, of contacting the earth joyfully with each step. You have a wonderful human mind, with its almost mystical capacity for language. These are already incredible sources of joy. Even those of us who lack one or more of these capacities can still find rich sources of happiness in the remaining ones, if we learn to appreciate them. Happiness isn't something that's only for other people. The capacity to be happy is in you already. It isn't the sole right of special people, of people with the right genes, the right connections, the right looks. Often, what blocks you most from being happy is the idea that you don't deserve it. But deserving is only a concept. It's not about deserving or not deserving. Happiness simply is. Finally, because happiness is always available, you can be happy right now. In fact, now is the only time you can be happy. The Buddha taught that the past is gone and the future is not yet here. The only time you can be alive is now. Now is when life is available. Do you believe you had happiness at some time in the past, but now it's unavailable? The past is gone. Happiness isn't available in the past. If you want to enjoy a refreshing glass of cool water, now is the only time you can do it. You can't drink the water of yesterday. The source of true happiness is the good and nurturing things around you and within you right now. Do you think you will be happy in the future? The future isn't here. The future is never here. You can't be happy in the future any more than you can enjoy tomorrow's glass of water. If you don't know how to be happy in this moment, you won't be happy in the future either. The refreshing water that's available to you isn't a future glass of water any more than it's a past one. Both the future and the past are insubstantial images, hollow and empty, mere clouds and shadows. The past is a ghost, the future a dream. The water of life is available to you in all its concrete and vivid reality, but only here and only now. Thanks for listening to this excerpt from the audiobook, The Buddha's Way of Happiness, Healing Sorrow, Transforming Negative Emotion, and Finding Well-Being in the Present Moment. You can purchase the complete audiobook from any major online audiobook retailer. If you'd like more information, please visit yourgreatjourney.com. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you don't miss an episode. And if you like the show, please rate it and review it. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. Your Great Journey is brought to you by audiobook publisher Wetware Media. Wetware Media publishes a wide variety of personal transformation audiobooks available from any major online audiobook retailer. For more information, please visit wetwaremedia.com. That's W-E-T-W-A-R-E-M-E-D-I-A dot com.